All right, good morning. Um, my name is uh, Michael Walters. I work over at Capital One. Um, and uh, so apologies up front. This is not a, a heavy coding uh, presentation. So but you get in some coding samples at the, at the end. But this is more of a, a nod to kind of reactive thinking. And not just the type of reactive thinking that maybe you've read on like, you know, the uh, ReactX and some of the other um, sites out there or you know, if you've taken certain pledges. Um, this is uh, actually this uh, kind of reactive thinking you find in a lot of different areas uh, in what we do. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go into that a little bit, give some examples, um, and then, yes? Do I? Yeah. All right, I will project even louder. Okay. I'm, if that's not working. Okay, got it. So, uh, in application development, um, you know there are many best practices and methodologies that have come out in the in recent years that are, you know, um, in juxtaposition to what's come out in the past. And what I'm going to propose is that a lot of those are going from being more of a proactive mindset to a kind of a, a reactive mindset. So this is the, uh, the famous black peppered moth. Um, so this is a, a prime example of what we call um, industrial melanism. So during the industrial age in England, um, this moth uh, evolved from being a peppered moth up here to a much darker peppered moth. Um, and how it did this is it would sit on trees and birds would fly around and um, before the uh, um, industrial age, your peppered moth up here was, was much less likely to get eaten by birds. But as industrial pollution um, put soot and et cetera on all the tree trunks, the darker moth became uh, 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 the more dominant of the black peppered moth species. Um, and there's other examples that we see as well. So there's the, you know, currently like the Canadian squirrel, the ones that breed a little bit earlier, um, are actually uh, starting to thrive. So they, they spring used to be frozen in Canada, and now the squirrels are that breed a little bit earlier are dominating. Um, uh, and there's many other examples as well. Um, and you know, one way to look at this is cool. It took about a hundred years, and from basically, you know, close to zero percent um, to the end of the uh, 19th century, close to 100 percent of the moths were dark. Um, but, you know, we as people and as humans in our world, we can't really work like that. Like, that's just way too slow. Um, and one other thing is, is how does evolution work? So the, um, the moth here had already, uh, already had this trait. It had, if you will, been proactive in its species about having some ability to turn dark. So there were a few dark moths out there before the industrial age getting eaten by moths once in a while, or uh, birds. Um, and what a waste. If we had to do that with all of the things that we build, um, that would be crappy. Oh, but we do. Um, so there are examples from, you know, a few years ago, Java application servers, um, where there was a lot of pre-built functionality. Um, interoperability with third-party components. This was the kind of core value prop of the Java application server would handle all of the tough stuff for you. Um, unfortunately, um, what happened is the Java application server it had all this proactivity, if you will, um, built into the uh, system. Um, and what happened is over years, it become, came more and more behind what was current in technology. Um, you know, other side effects, not r specifically related to its kind of proactivity, is really hard to upgrade. So if you wanted to upgrade one little piece of it, you had to upgrade the whole thing. It got in the way of trying to uh, react to what you needed to do with your um, application. You had to go and upgrade the entire monolith. Um, it got in the way of reacting uh, quickly. 
Um, it also turned developers into application server specialists, which is its own form of evil. Now, out in the natural world, there are animals out there that are, uh, that are reactive of nature. So the, the chameleon, for example, um, it spent its energy um, learning to react to the world. So instead of the moth, which took a hundred years um, to become, you know, turn from the peppered moth to a, a darker pe peppered moth, the chameleon would have been just fine. Um, it had built in a uh, mechanisms to react to the world. Um, so the uh, there's a uh, an inspiration for this talk. So um, if anybody's seen um, Brett Victor's Inventing on Principle, um, so he uh, you know um, was looking for a way to um, inspire himself for the type of uh, you know applications and coding that he was doing. Um, you know, it wasn't just was he just building or is he building for a purpose, um, for a principle, as he said. All right. Apologies. Yeah. Apologies about that. Um, so what Br Brett Victor proposed is that we find a principle um, to believe in and that you find is necessary to put into your work. Um, you know, almost something that if it's not there, it's just, it's irritating to you. Um, and he gave some really good examples. Um, so first he, he showed what he built. Um, so. Brett Victor's uh, principle was that creators uh, need an immediate connection with what they built. So he built a whole framework uh, that when he updated some his JavaScript, the tree over here would immediately change color or change shape, um, that there wouldn't be have a reload effect or anything like that. that was, it was immediate. Um, he found that the that kind of like loss of time that you get when you're developing and you have to compile, run to see if it works, and then go back. As a, as a pure irritation to his life. Um, and so he went about um, developing ways to, to not do that. Um, Larry Tesler, um, famous for inventing copy and paste, um, actually really hated modes. So I actually love VI, um, but the, uh, uh, he hated VI with a passion. And anything that would cause you to um, have to essentially create a new mode in order to, make, to do something, he probably hated the shift key. Um, the, so he used this no modes um, kind of mindset uh, to go and think of things for like developing copy and paste functionality. Um, Richard Stallman, um, software must be free. So this is a driving principle in all of his activities. Um, and Douglas Engelbert, so invented the mouse. But really, um, what drove his, uh, what inspired him to build was uh, that he wanted better interaction between the human and the computer. Um, and what's this opposed at to? This is uh, there's there there are craftsmen and and problem solvers, people that go from one thing to another, fix it, engineer it, move on with their lives. They're not really building for inspire. They don't have an inspiration or a principle. Um, so uh, 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 Breck Victor gave the example of like Thomas Edison. He wasn't really building for any kind of like main goal. He just was an engineer and loved to build. And that's fine. Um, but, you know, is it better to kind of build for a principle? 
And so I'd been thinking about this for a while and came up with my principle. Um, and that's a prioritize for reactive attributes and do not waste time trying to be proactive. The world is a changing place. Technologies change all the time. Um, in the applications that we build, requirements change, timelines change. Um, if I were to sit around and proactively come across, think of all the things um, that may or may not happen, and most of them end up in the not category, um, I just won't be able to move ahead. So what if I spend all of my energies learning how to react to uncertain um, situations faster? That if in every single aspect of when I'm you know, designing or building um, uh, a product, that I take this reactivity mindset and apply it to it. Um, and so, and some of the goals that we want are to minimize inertia. So that time when things go to committee, that time when nobody knows what the next step is to do, um, that's a killer for um, uh, my reactive solution. Faster response times, similar to inertia uh, in concept, but uh, the causes are a little different. We just want to be fast. What are the things that we can build into our systems, applications, um, uh, and the way we manage our products that are going to make things quicker, faster? Um, and being resilient. Um, you know, if I'm going to rely on um, uh, being r reacting to situations, I need to not fall over when things, when bad things happen, either from within my application, or managing the applications, or uh, any aspect of my life, really. Um, that's as opposed to your, you know, your proactive thinker, who maybe is going to be thinking a lot more about the things that are going to be the bullets that are flying their direction. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to review some rules of thumbs that will help you react uh, faster as we build our apps. And let's go, let's go a little Rumsfeldian first, just to set, set the context a little more. I, if anybody's not seen the Rumsfeld on this, it's, it's just it's, it's amusing. But it's a really great construct. Um, and uh, so this is really just a way of kind of how do you manage and assess risk. It's a, it's a framework that there's your known knowns. There's the, the things you know, you know. There's your unknown knowns. There's, you know, I know. Uh, oh, sorry. There's your known unknowns. Um, there's the things I know that are out there. Uh, but I don't know exactly when they're in the curse. So an example of that's like a, I, uh, you know, airlines will can't will flights will be canceled sometimes. Um, I can plan for that. Um, I don't know when it's going to occur, when it's not going to occur, um, but it's a possibility. Um, and then uh, in Donald Rumsfeld's world, he said that there's your unknown unknowns. There's the things I don't know that I don't know, and I, but I do know that they exist. They're out there. Um, and he went further, I'll just read this little uh, quote, he says, and if you look throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it's this latter category, the unknown unknowns, that tend to be the difficult ones. So there are things that you, and why is that? You can't be proactive about them. I don't know uh, all of these unknown unknowns, but if I build systems that are great at reacting, if I plan reactively, um, and if I, you know, put in mechanisms that allow me to make quick snap and good judgments, um, then I'll be able to handle this much better. Um, Rumsfeld didn't really go into the, um, the unknown knowns, um, but these are, you know, uh, these are actually things that you want to ignore about yourself that are actually true. So, um, you know, in, in technology, there's, there's a lot of teams that maybe like they, they, you know, act in a waterfall method, or they act in a waterfall method, but they, they claim it's a uh, agile. Um, or for Rumsfeld, it was, you know, this, uh, you know, the awful uh, uh, prisons at Abu Ghraib and et cetera. Like, we knew they were bad, but we chose to mentally ignore those, uh, um, those problems. Um, for an organization like the, you know, the U.S. government or the military, um, you know, they can afford to be proactive. They get 
like roughly about 3.5% of the GDP. They have resources upon resources. That's not true for pretty much anybody in this room. Um, they can plan for all the proactive things out there. But if you're resource constrained at all, um, planning to be to react faster is going to be your better bet. So let's go into um, a couple of different areas where this uh, where this applies. So organizational structures. Um, what are the things? How can we build our teams um, to allow us to um, act faster? So, you know, one thing to do is to make sure that everybody knows who's responsible for what when a problem goes down. And this applies not. This applies to uh, whoever the responsible party is. It could be an individual, a group, or even an application. Um, when we need a new feature uh, to be delivered into a system. <laughs> Which is the uh, which application should that be built in, or should a new one be built? Um, the those de that decision making process. Um, if we have very you know clear brand, clear strong boundaries, um, we're going to understand who that is. There's not a debate. We don't. Our reaction time is is short. Um, autonomous responsible parties. So we've all had uh, you know wanted to add new features into our applications or needed to take a time out to do um, some, you know, uh, build some non-functional requirements, refactoring and et cetera. Um, the uh, deciding body on who does that, um, if it has to go out to committee, if you have to take it off to the sales teams and the marketing teams to, to ask if you should do things, um, the more you can build into your, your organization the that each individual uh, team out there, or responsible party, can make their own decisions, um, the faster you're going to be at reacting. Um, and uh, linked to that is enablement. So there has to be a culture of, ena of enablement. So people can't be afraid to make decisions. Um, so going back to what we uh, the, had the, the tardigrade up there earlier, but prioritize resiliency. So one of the, the important things, that if I'm, if I'm going to not spend my time trying to be proactive, I need to make sure that my uh, that things don't fall down and break over um, when uh, 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 I ha give me time to react. Um, this only applies to like you know everybody builds applications with ASGs and load balancers today. I hope, um, but it do applies to things like you know having you know new two subject matter experts for any single party or application that if any. If anybody is goes on vacation, um, that your your team is resilient from those skill sets. Um, it applies to you know whatever type of concept where you have a, a kind of a single point of failure. Um, uh, Link to that is dispersed risk. So um, as much as possible, um, we want to reduce those kind of single point of failures um, in our in our systems. So you know. In uh, uh, I'll give an example from Capital One. So in Capital One, we have you know a, kind of a single you know sign-on system. So there's like a large you know LDAP enabled AD environment. Um, when this thing has problems, it just creates slews of issues throughout the whole organization. That's centralized risk. Um, what that does is it makes it so it makes it hard for me um, as a user of that service to react quickly to changes. Um, and then lastly, this, is m this applies mostly to kind of people organizations, but you have to, under to have a debate within your team about whether flat is better or smaller teams are better. Um, so a flat organization um, is going to be able to, as new requirements come up, as new um, objectives come up, to be able to swing over um, and get the proper amount of resources working on those problems faster. Um, the uh, uh, problem with that is you might, it's contrary to um, the strong boundaries principle. So do I know exactly who to go to in that team to go and fix a problem when one s occurs? And that's versus the small teams. Do I create teams of four or five that are all focused around the same objective? Um, the, uh, uh, and, I, and I think the answer is uh, Andy Grove had a, has this concept called task-relevant maturity. 
and it's really um, uh, about teams and individuals. How much do they know about what they're doing? Um, are they subject matter experts, domain experts in, in what they're building? Um, you can afford to have a flatter organization um, if everybody uh, in there is a higher level of task relevant maturity. If everybody kind of knows what, you, what they're doing, um, that you, don't, you, you tend not to have that kind of one or two peop people problem um, that know everything about a problem. Um, this applies to uh, uh, product management. Um, so as we're going and designing what are the, what are the requirements and features that we want to build into our application, um, you know, a lot of people go and look at the competition um, and see to, to try and understand what features they need to build. Um, actually, the better, the better bet if you want to build for reactivity is to look at the environment. Um, this allows me to not just look at my pie and try to get a bigger piece of, piece of my pie, but understand better what are the different pies out there that I'm not actually um, uh, building towards. Is there, are there other markets uh, that I could be you know, building out or dominating um, rather than just continuing to focus um, on my own pie? Um, key to being able to do, uh, to be able to react is having enough data points. So this is where testing comes into play. Um, um, I, can't, I can't react if I don't know uh, what my current state is. I need to be able to under understand quickly um, what are those inflection points out there. Um, the, uh, and so what I need to do is build enough what I've been coined as reaction points. So iteratively, um, building out systems where I can understand if I'm doing building the right thing um, and understanding if that's a point when I need to um, pivot and change course and the faster that I do that the faster that I'll be able to ensure that I'm building um, the correct thing um, and I'll cover the, the the last one here the um, so the the product management framework so which one uh, uh, you know there's Waterfall, Kanban, um, Scrum. Uh, you know, which one of these are going to allow me to react faster to changes? Um, so on my teams, we've all gone towards the, uh, to the, the Kanban style. So the Kanban is based around what are the different work streams? Uh, what, are, what, is, you know, what are teams working on right now? Um, are those the most important things to be working on at that exact moment? Um, you know, that differs from your kind of like your scrum agile, which is all about parceling up things into even pieces of time. Um, it's not work focused as much as um, making sure that you understand like what are, you know, that your work is um, all even, that you can kind of start tracking velocity and et cetera. Um, but it doesn't really allow you to um, prioritize your uh, work streams as well as, as your Kanban. Um, and I won't go into the waterfall debate. But there is a time and place for that. Um, application design. Uh, so, you know, in general, um, so a lot of this is, I, I mentioned that a lot of the kind of, you know, the uh, you know, modern best practices and et cetera um, that, you know, we found out in the, the system. So microservices versus monolith, well, I, I I imagine most people here would say that in, in general, microservices would be a better um, architecture. But the reason for that is because microservices allow you to react faster. That if one of those um, systems needs to be upgraded or changed, you can do it at a much faster velocity um, because it's smaller. It allows you to react faster. Um, and uh, uh, even faster than that is a serverless compute. So, you know. If I don't have to worry about the entire infrastructure stack and et cetera, if I can just have uh, lambdas out there, um, that's fantastic. Um, I even think like uh, for AWS might even allow you to just slap a Docker image out there and run it as a lambda. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, so uh, non-opinionated frameworks. So you know, I'd, I'd cover kind of like the the JBoss and WebLogic. So the, um, those were highly opinionated frameworks. Um, they, you know, not only manage how you ran your web, how you interact with the database, um, 
how you built up your EJBs and et cetera. Um, but we also find this out into the Python world as well. So, you know, using my kind of what's going to allow me to react faster um, mindset, I want more control over the underlying components in my in my frameworks. So, when I get into the the Django versus Flask debate, it's really easy. I have a mindset that tells me I, I need to be able to react faster. Um, what's going to what allows me to more control over all the different components in my app? Um, for your data scientists out there, um, so one one concept we're building into all of our um, applications is uh, uh, this concept of true sourcing. So, and that's getting data that's as uh, as close to the original source as you, as possible. Um, it's it's almost like a rule of uh, of nature um, with uh, when you work with data, is that. The more kind of like opportunities that somebody has to do that kind of the the T and the and the ETL, that somebody's going to do that, possibly for a good reason at that given point. But what it means is it makes it harder for me to understand what a, what what's that what is in that data. Um, I'll, I'll I'll give an example from uh, uh, Capital One. So we work with the uh, credit cards, if you don't know, um, and uh, the credit card transaction data has a field in it that's called the um, authorized user. So when there's, uh, you have an account, and if you have more, more than one person on the account, then there's more than one authorized user. And uh, within Capital One, we had had a surrogate ID. It's called the Plastic Surrogate ID that uh, replaced that. Um, as, we were, as we were moving up from the on-prem out, um, out to the cloud, uh, a, a security person, for probably a really good reason, said that you know this Plastic Surrogate ID um, uh, was breakable, was hackable. Um, we could uh, figure out what the actual authorized um, account number was, um, and you know that who knows that would create some bad things. Um, and what that did, though, is for our applications that needed to understand the different authorized users. So specifically, we were building a recurring transactions model, so trying to understand, you know. Uh, identify Netflix as a recurring payment, or Verizon Wireless, or even when you write a check, um, could I identify the ca that cadence as a as a recurring payment? Um, the uh, having the authorized user on that was was critically important. We couldn't run our models um, without some key that uh, identified the different authorized users, and it was just gone. Um, if we had uh, uh, used true source principle, so if we had not allowed the um, transformations um, to happen in, in place. If we'd gone through the necessary steps to get security access to the to the raw data, we'd have been much better. Um, it would allow us to to react faster. Um, Event-based design. I'll get into that a little bit further. Um, Part of resilience and uh, uh, testing. Um, so. Sure. Uh, uh, we've one thing that's important with uh, um, if I'm building in a, with a reactive mindset, why testing is is more important um, is as I'm going through, I want to be able to understand as I pull out each of my different components of my applications, as I'm trying to react to the world faster. Um, I want I need to know if it's going to impact the rest of my rest of my system. So I said smaller is better. Um, the only way that I'm going to know if, if as I pull out one piece to react to the world, that it's not going to hit the domino and knock over the whole system, is if I have a, a well-tested platform. Um, and so, uh, getting, uh, getting close to the end. So, uh, and then lastly, this is a little bit on uh, reactive programming. Um, so, the the kind of key to understanding what a reactive program is, it's, it's programming with a, a asynchronous data structures. So, uh, um, and another key to that is basically anything can be treated as a, an asynchronous data structure. Um, they're cheap, they're ubiquitous. Um, I can treat anything within the, the app as, a, as, as some type of message. Um, 
There's a, uh, a data pattern that uh, is used within uh, uh, um, reactive programming called um, the observer pattern. It's one of the kind of like, you know, top 23 from the, the gang of four. Um, and basically, uh, the core concept here is that um, all variables in your systems change over time, and, and those changes are uh, observable. So, if we go into a little bit of a uh, bit of code here, um, so this is uh, uh, connecting out to a, a database, um, doing a, a quick select to get the information for customer IDs one, three, and five. So you have a simple select statement up there. Um, and what this is doing is it's building um, the, here's the uh, observable. I can call this from anywhere in my code. Um, the, the nice thing about this is that the, the business logic is very clear. Um, there's not a lot of try and catch blocks um, in here. It's built into the framework that it's going to handle errors. This right here is the, this lambda uh, right here um, ends up being the observer. There's some call additions I can put into there to handle errors um, if, I, if, if I need to. Um, in a production application, you probably would. Um, but this little bit of code um, replaces a lot of, uh, um, you know, probably, you know, probably three or four functions that you would do to do the same thing within a, a standard application. Um, and the key here is that uh, uh, this can be, you can basically do this with anything. So this is, this kind of a reactive concept came first from uh, uh, building out websites. Um, but, you know, here's this example with a, with a, just a pure database call. Um, shows you can do with anything. And then here. Um, so, if you take this uh, reactive concept, um, you know, instead of spending all that time and energy looking to be uh, proactive with yourself, as you go and decide which, which framework to build with your application, as you decide to uh, go and f figure out which feature um, you should build, or um, how you should develop your, the internals of your application, um, for me, it's what's going to allow me to react the, the fastest. Um, and what I encourage you guys to do is also find that thing that makes you tick. What's the what's that core principle that's going to um, make it so your work is a little bit more meaningful? That's going to be a driving principle and help you, you know, decide the different aspects of what we do, which is uh, build applications. So thank you.